Hi everybody, welcome back. And if you are new, hi, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel, I cover true crime cases. And pretty much all of the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. Continuing my series of solved September for this month, today we dive into a cold case that was finally solved due to DNA testing, a method not available at the time of the crime. One main aspect of this case was the intense debate surrounding the guilt of the primary suspect, an individual that was basically there since day one. This case unfolded with its fair share of unexpected events, yet ultimately justice prevailed. I combed through quite a few newspaper articles for this one, mostly from the Californian, and recent articles after its resolution. This is the solved case of Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone. Sonia was born on May 27th of 1951 to parents Anthony and Stella in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. During the early 1970s, she decided to make the move and a big move from Quebec, Canada down to sunny Carmel by the sea, California. She went on to marry a man named Michael Stone in 1976, and they welcomed into the world a beautiful baby girl, Sasha Stone. She and Michael did end up separating though sometime before her tragic murder. Now, occasionally during a separation, one of the individuals or both might want to have a change of scenery and move somewhere new, but Sonia enjoyed the area she lived in and remained there focusing on raising her daughter and performing well at her job in sales and merchandising for the jeans manufacturer, Levi Strauss and Company. Overall, Sonia lived a pretty normal life for a mother in the early 1980s. She had her family, she had her friends, and she just wanted to provide a good life for her four-year-old daughter. But her life would meet its untimely end in mid-October of 1981 at the age of 30 years old. On Thursday, October 15th, of 1981, at around noon while Sonia's daughter was at school. Sonia's friend, Carol McBride, decides to pay her friend a visit. She arrived at 26363 Rio Avenue in Carmel by the Sea, having no idea what she was going to see when she walked into the home. It was a scene that would stay with her for the rest of her life. Carol found Sonia's lifeless body on her living room floor just inside the front door. The Monterey County Sheriff's Department took it from there. According to an article released the next day by the Californian, Sonia was found partially clothed and had been the victim of a sexual assault, and they were also trying to determine if she had been the victim of a robbery as well. Later on, though, they would discover that nothing valuable was taken from her home, so robbery did not seem like the motive. Based on reports and articles I came across, some of her clothing had been ripped and pulled up and pulled off of her, but she still had her coat on and purse near her, which is what made them think she had been attacked very quickly after she walked into her home during the morning of October 15th, sometime after her daughter went to school for the day. Her cause of death was ruled to be strangulation caused by pantyhose that were found wrapped around her neck. Based on that article I just highlighted, Monterey County Coroner Harvey Hilburn said that there were signs of a struggle. Sonia definitely fought back. When it comes to Sonia attempting to fight off her attacker, we know this had to be true because she had a broken nail on her left ring finger. This nail had blood underneath it, believed to be the blood of her killer, that she possibly scratched him so forcefully that it drew blood. Deputy District Attorney for Monterey County, Matthew Leroux, told People Magazine in February of 2023, the testimony was that her back door was unlocked, so we are presuming that is likely how he gained entry. We didn't find any other signs of forced entry, and we don't think she would have let him in. In the Californian released the day after the murder took place, authorities stated that there were no arrests and no suspects in the case yet, but they were conducting a thorough investigation into her murder. Well, according to the Monterey County District Attorney's Office on October 16th, an officer was conducting a neighborhood canvas and came across a man with a deep scratch on his face. The man was Michael Scott Glazebrook. He was about a month shy of his 26th birthday. And he lived across the street from Sonia and had only moved into the home a few months prior to her murder. When authorities questioned him regarding the cut on his cheek, he told them he received it while cutting plexiglass. Yet, it was his parents who would say that he told them that he received the scratch from a fight at Monterey Peninsula College. 
which story was true. Were either of them? Could it be that the scratch came from Sonia trying to save her life? Michael Glazebrook's friend, Michelle Wilson, would state that he admitted to her that he had been in Sonia's home on the morning of the murder. Michael Glazebrook would be arrested for two outstanding traffic warrants and during the arrest for that, he was again questioned regarding the murder of Sonia. The timeline of events leading up to the arrest for her murder is a little fuzzy, but according to the Californian, Michael Glazebrook was arrested for the murder of Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone on July 22nd of 1982. When it comes to whether Sonia and Michael knew each other at all in any way while she was alive, or possibly Sonia knew his wife, friends and family could not verify that. According to them, Sonia never mentioned Michael or his wife. It did not seem like they had any previous contact, and if they had, it wasn't influential enough for her to mention it to anyone she knew. The trial began in early November of 1982, and one of the most confusing aspects of this trial was the fact that two medical examiners gave contradicting conclusions to their examinations as to whether the victim had been sexually assaulted or not. Dr. Edward Blake stated that there were no indications of a rape, while Dr. Boyd Stevens stated that the victim had been raped primarily based on the bruises on her body. From all of my research, it doesn't seem like they found semen inside of her body or on her body, but they would end up finding traces of another bodily liquid on her, which we will get to momentarily. The main theory is that rape had been the killer's objective, but it was not fully carried out. Like I stated, there was no semen found in or on her, but there was saliva found on one of her nipples. This, along with the DNA from under her nail, would be what eventually solved her case. According to an article released by The Californian on November 11th of 1982, Michelle Wilson took the stand and claimed that she had been really confused by the detectives who had been firing questions at her during the interview process, that she simply felt in the hot seat, and she recanted her entire story about Michael Glazebrook telling her that he had been in Sonia's home on the morning of her murder. Deputy District Attorney Robert Moody was surprised by Michelle Wilson's testimony, and he called up Sheriff's Detectives J.T. James and Lynn's Dorman to the stand in an attempt to discredit her claims. Both detectives had been in the room during the interviews with her and stated she did say these things and that they weren't pressuring her to say them. Moody asked the court to admonish Michelle as a witness, though and they did. So she was not a part of the trial anymore. During the trial, Michael's parents would take the stand and they, under oath, told the court that they never saw scratches on their son's face at any point in the time after Sonia was murdered. The prosecutors would stick though by their claim that they believe Michael had obtained the scratches from Sonia during the attack that ended her life. Courtesy of the Californian released on February 25th of 1983, the trial was set to continue until April 11th due to the defense attorney, John Siegel, requesting more time to interview witnesses considering some of the witnesses were living out of town, some of them as far away as Washington, D.C. The next day, the Californian reported that the Monterey County Superior Court judge, Maurice Jourdain, stated that he did not believe he could find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt based on the evidence presented at the preliminary hearing in November. But the evidence did support the municipal court decision to hold Glazebrook to answer to the charge in Superior Court. So he was refusing to drop the murder charge and the defense attorney, John Siegel, claimed that he thought the judge had feelings concerning the evidence because he sat on the municipal court bench for the defendant's bail reduction hearing during August. Siegel said that there was no evidence to have Michael Glazebrook bound over to stand trial. The official date that Michael Glazebrook was set to stand trial was June 20th of 1983 but it was dismissed that morning. Judge Silver called the investigatory procedures surreptitious and illegal. That Michael Glazebrook had originally been arrested for traffic warrants, and then he was being questioned for a murder. He stated that Michael had been questioned while in a weakened psychological condition. That police kept transporting Michael back and forth and back and forth between Salinas and Monterey in an attempt to keep his family from posting his $165 bail in one location to get him released. 
that the ruse could have resulted in involuntary statements. It was actually Deputy District Attorney Robert Moody who requested the dismissal after Judge Silver had granted these pretrial motions to suppress evidence during the trial. So the trial was fully dismissed at this time with Michael Glazebrook's family being ecstatic. During when the trial was dismissed, Michael Glazebrook's attorney, this time Richard Rosen, stated that the evidence of police misconduct was overwhelming. It's a shame it had to come to trial. The pattern of trying to fudge things, of fitting the shoe to the ugly stepsister goes all the way through the case. He said that the district attorney's office could refile charges and it may still not be over with, but if it isn't over with, it might be good to take a fresh look at the case. Well, they would refile charges on July 18th of 1983, and Michael Glazebrook was scheduled for arraignment August 23rd. Based on an article released by the Californian on October 10th, it seems like this trial was going similarly to how the last one had ended. This new judge, Judge E.J. Leach, upheld a lower court decision to suppress statements by Michael Glazebrook to a former FBI agent and blood samples taken from the suspect at the time of an arrest. He claimed that this information and evidence was obtained both legally and illegally. Glazebrook's attorney, Richard Rosen, stated that they had arrested him for two outstanding traffic warrants and then began questioning him in connection to the slaying. He called the arrest a pretext and contended that investigators intentionally interfered with his ability to post bail for traffic warrants, which resulted in him being unable to leave and them further questioning him for the murder. And this was a violation of his rights and it tainted all evidence uncovered. This method was referred to as fruit of the poisonous tree. Fruit of the poisonous tree is a legal term. It is a doctrine that extends the exclusionary rule to make evidence inadmissible in court if it was derived from evidence that was illegally obtained. During this trial, witness accounts were all over the place, with neighbors claiming that Michael Glazebrook had not been home at the time of the murder, that they did not see his green pickup truck in his driveway that morning, meaning that if he was not home, he couldn't have killed his neighbor. There was also Peter Hammond, who claimed that Michael had been at his place of work until between 10.15 a.m. to 10.45 a.m on the morning of the murder. When it came to the scratch on Michael Glazebrook's face, it is said that he got it from cutting plexiglass for a boat in his backyard. That was the story. Dr. Robert Cushing, who was an emergency room physician at the community hospital of the Monterey Peninsula College, took the stand and testified that he treated Michael for the cut the day after the murder and that it was not inconsistent with a scratch from a fingernail. Michael's mother, Jean, actually also worked at the community hospital as well, but she was not there that day that he went to get checked out for a scratch. I do wanna mention that there are no photos on record of the scratch on his face, but for him to go get it checked out, it must have been a pretty deep one. During this trial though, it really seemed like a lot of things that people stated before the trial during police questioning was a bit different than what they said on the stand but the original notes from the interviews had been destroyed. So it was just a he said, she said situation with officers at this point. They had no proof of what certain people originally said during those police interviews. Michael Glazebrook had been asked where he was the day of the murder, and he stated that he had been playing softball. Yet, none of his softball teammates had ever been reached out to. Investigators never reached out to his team members regarding whether he had a scratch on his face that day or not. Michael's parents stated that the day of the murder, Michael had showed up at their seaside home around 11, 10 a.m. and was picking up some clothing. They said that he arrived early for lunch from his job as a technician supervisor with the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. They stated that they then later on attended the softball game with Michael's wife and that after the game, everyone returned to the family home. They stated that they did not see scratches on his face during this day. Now, I was not able to find any information when it came to what his wife said and if she said that she saw any scratches on his face during this day, but I feel like if she did, this would have been highlighted somewhere. The end of the trial though, 
it ended in a mistrial. It was a hung jury with nine people in favor of him being not guilty and three in favor of him being guilty. Due to the jury not reaching a unanimous decision though, double jeopardy was not a factor and they could go through with a retrial eventually. Also, there is no statute of limitations when it comes to serious felonies like murder. But it just did not seem like at the time there was enough evidence to convict him. All they really had at the time was word of a scratch on his face and that he lived across the street and a bunch of different witness accounts. They would have to wait years until technology advanced enough to finally solve Sonia's case, a case that was eventually reopened in 2020. According to the Monterey County District Attorney's Office, the renewed investigation included forensic testing unavailable at the time of the original trial. Authorities obtained a search warrant for new samples from Michael Glazebrook. Everything was then sent over to the Department of Justice DNA lab and they tested the DNA found under Sonia's fingernail and on her breast and they tested that DNA against the DNA of Michael Glazebrook. After almost 40 years, it was discovered that he was in fact the one who took her life. The DNA was a match. On Sunday, August 15th of 2021, 65 year old Michael Glazebrook was arrested as he was driving away from his seaside home. Now, a part of the story that really just touched my heart and made me tear up is that in honor of Sonia, officers wore Levi's jeans to make the arrest. Michael Glazebrook remained at the Monterey County Jail where he was being held and his bail was set at a whopping million dollars. This case was prosecuted by the Monterey County District Attorney's Office Cold Case Task Force, which was a task force established in 2020 to investigate, solve, and prosecute cold case homicides in Monterey County. The case was investigated by Monterey County Sheriff's Office Detective Eris Wilson with the assistance of investigators Sarah Jackson and Rachel Maldonado. Also, retired Monterey County Sheriff Detective Lynn Storman, the original lead investigator, provided valuable testimony about the investigation in the 1980s. After an eight day jury trial during this year, they found Michael Glazebrook guilty of first degree murder with enhancements for using a deadly weapon and for committing rape. His schedule for sentencing was held for April 26th of this year. On June 12th of this year, the Monterey County District Attorney Janine M. Petroni announced to the public that Michael Scott Glazebrook, age 67, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the 1981 murder of Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone. Sonia's daughter, Sasha, was quoted saying, the family just wanted to express our tremendous gratitude for this team. Sonia was a wonderful woman and we're so happy to see justice for her. Matthew LaRoe stated, it's just an honor to bring this to a conclusion and see that justice is done. The crazy thing is that back in 1983, Michael Glazebrook's attorney at the time, Richard Rosen, said that the case was done, but it was far from that. It just took time is all. Even though the evidence back then did not stand up in court, they had their guy basically the entire time. I know that some people may be wondering if there was ever another suspect or person of interest, and yes, there was. Right after the murder happened, one of the main people looked at was Sonia's ex-husband, Michael Stone. Officials had phoned him after the murder. He had been living and working in Marin County, which is an area about 160 miles north of Carmel by the sea, about a three hour drive. And after hearing of what happened, Michael immediately hopped in his car and drove down to Sonia's home, and upon arrival, he learned that he was a suspect. Based on statistics from 1980 to 2008, nearly one out of five murder victims were killed by an intimate partner, with more women being killed by men than men being killed by women. So her family and investigators did look at Michael Stone as possibly having some involvement in his ex-wife's murder. Sonia's friend Carol, the one who found her body, would go on to tell investigators that Michael Stone was unfit to care for his daughter and that Sonia and Michael had been separated at the time of her murder. The family physician, Dr. Milton Estes, did examine Sasha and determine there were no indications of child molestation or other wrongful conduct by her father. 
Still, she had to spend eight days in the care of Child Protective Services. After that, she was sent to live with her father. Then sometime later, she went to live with a relative in British Columbia, Canada. At one point, Michael Stone had began dating a new woman. She had been a Nevada City Council member and not long after they began dating each other, an ex-wife of Michael Stone's had reached out to her and according to Michael, told her that he was abusive towards her, he was a child molester, and that he had killed his wife. Due to that, this new girlfriend of his cut things off with him. Then years later, Michael himself moved to British Columbia. In July of 2022 though, after the case was on the track to finally being solved, Michael Stone moved back to Nevada County. I bring up this information for a reason, and that is because I can't say for certain how Michael Stone treated someone in a private relationship, but he was known in the area as the guy who killed his wife for quite a while, and it comes out that he wasn't the one responsible. Regarding the two women, the one that dated Michael and the one that had been married to Michael, Matthew Leroux said, it is true that those two individuals attempted to introduce evidence into the recent trial of the cold case. The judge did not accept the evidence from the woman that he had dated because it was not enough to raise reasonable doubt against the defendant. Glazebrook. He went on to say, it is true that the presiding judge, Honorable Pamela L. Butler, did dismiss the evidence, but I cannot go into detail about that evidence. He lastly said, Michael Stone absolutely did not murder his wife. Back to the actual killer though. From my research, Michael Glazebrook had worked as a Selena's bus driver. And when he was questioned back in 2021, he actually changed up his story and said that on the day of the murder, he had been at school, which is far different than the story he and his loved ones gave back then. It didn't matter though what his new story was that he was giving authorities, he was eventually found guilty. And in the end, her family now has a little more peace of mind knowing Sonia's killer is no longer walking free. This was something that they were waiting so long for over four decades. Sasha Stone told KSBW, it's been a day that we've been waiting for for a really long time. So that is the case of Sonia Carmen Herrick Stone. It is one that as soon as I saw this year, it had been finally solved, especially after the roller coaster of events that it went through. I knew that it was going to be on my list of cases to cover this month. Thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about this case. And of course, like always, leave any of your thoughts and opinions about this case down below in the comments. But above all, leave some kind words down there as well for the loved ones of who today's video revolves around. If you have any cases, especially solved cases for this month's theme that you possibly want me to cover here on my channel, make sure to send those over to gabulosiscaserequests at gmail.com and I will see you all in the next one.